Welcome back everyone. In this week's video, I'm gonna be breaking down this shoot that I did for Positively Aware Magazine. And I shot four different lifestyle images in different parts of this cabaret bar in order to create a series of images that would be just that, a night at the cabaret, if you will. That was the main theme that we were going with. My friend who's the editor of the magazine called me at the last minute and asked me to come and do the shoot because the photographer that he had booked uh, was going to be unavailable all of a sudden at the last minute. Now, I didn't take any sort of offense to this because as a business owner, I like to spread out my business to different vendors. That way, if possible, that way, if any one vendor becomes unavailable, I can go on to the next one and not interrupt my business. So the fact that he works with multiple photographers, of course, is no big deal. And I was happy to come and help out. So he sent me some photos of the space and this was about an hour and a half or so before I showed up, I rushed off to the studio and started to gather my gear. And while I was doing that, I was thinking about how I was going to light the scene and, and sort of the ideas that I could come up with the story. And I was further coming up with that on the drive over uh, to the bar. And I arrived maybe about 10 minutes after all of the subjects arrived and I started to sort of figure things out. And I had to move really quickly and things were a little bit chaotic. And so um, things weren't quite as I would have done had I had a little bit of advanced planning. For instance, I might have had someone there to shoot video, but on this shoot, I didn't. And so I'm gonna be sharing with you today a series of still images, some behind the scenes images, and also some graphics that I created in Elixir's Satellite 3D. And if you're interested in any of the gear that I'm using, during this shoot, it's gonna be listed in the description below. And if you click on those links, that will help support me a little bit as I'll make a small commission. And if you wanna check out the software Satellite 3D, just use the coupon code John15 and the link in the description uh, to check it out. So let's go ahead and start looking at the images. And I'll start off here with the final image. That way you can get a very good sense of what is about to happen. Now, as we move on to this frame, you can see the ambient exposure. And I was shooting at 1 125th at 4.5 at ISO 400. And that was so that I could get the ambient lights to show up in the frame. This was very important. So all of those little lights that you see there, I wanted them to contribute to our final exposure. And so that's why they are there in the shot. Now the first artificial light that I'm gonna show you is this kicker here and I set it up on camera left so that light would come into the scene and sort of mimic the light that's coming from the lamp that's over here. And that's why I wanted to sort of have um, that's my motivation for that light because I wanted to give a sense that the light in the room was also on the subjects even though they were being lit primarily with my lights that I was adding. Now let's go ahead and look at the key lights that I was using. I was using both a 70 centimeter Octobox on one side and then a 100 centimeter Octobox on the other side, lighting up the two subjects at the ticket window. I'm not really sure that I thought through why one was on one side or the other, but let's say that the reason why I put the 100 on camera right was because I wanted that larger source to also potentially light the actors or models, if you will, that were over here on the left-hand side of the frame. That's why I was going for it, um, let's say, uh, with that. That was my motivation there. Now, a small light that's contributing to the scene is a light that I placed outside of the room on the stairs. This is a basement club. So that light is out there on the stairs with a yellow gel pointed down. And I wanted that to shine through the window and sort of light up the back of my shot, but also give the sense that maybe this is light coming from outside. And that's why at night, and that's why this light is gelled yellow. So now you can see what it looks like with all of the lights in the scene turned on at the same time. And as you can see, it's a little dark over here on camera left with these uh, uh, subjects that are sort of in the background, if you will, with our main subject who's handing over her ticket. And so I decided that it might be a little bit better if they were to be walking down the stairs as a couple and not really participating in that ticket exchange uh, at that moment. Maybe they're too good for the line and they're skipping it and they don't have to pay because they're special. 
I don't know, something like that. Make up the story however you like. But to light them, I used a one by three foot or 90 by 30 centimeter uh, strip softbox with a grid and I had it there horizontal uh, lighting their faces. The reason why I was using the grid is because I didn't want the light to go all over the scene and wash things out. And so I had that there in order to just keep the light on those two people as they were coming down the stairs. And because I hated all of those government regulatory signs that were right there on the wall in the large gold frame, I decided to strip them out and put in an early copy of the magazine. This is an HIV publication that's been around for a number of years, I believe 25 to 30. Uh, my friend will be mad at me that I don't know. Um, but this is in particular their drug guide. So once a year they have this special uh, issue that's all about the medications that are available on the market. And so I thought that it would be cute if he sent me a PDF of that first copy of the drug guide and I put it into the window and then I threw a little drop shadow on there. Well, let me rephrase that. Um, I had the retoucher um, fill in the wall so that it was red. And then I decided that as an option for the magazine, I would cut out the gold frame myself and layer it on top of everything and then sandwich that old magazine in the middle there and apply some drop shadow to the picture frame uh, going the same direction as uh, from left to right so that it would look like it was married um, into the scene a little bit more. And also I uh, made it a little brighter on the left hand side near the lamp so that it would look more uh, realistic and less pasted in. It probably still looks pasted in, but I thought it was kind of a funny uh, wink and nod to the past and a better look than having those horrible uh, government documents sitting there. So for this next shot, when I saw the piano and its juxtaposition to the stairs, I knew that I wanted to create a shot where someone was sitting there playing with all of the other people sort of wrapped around them on the stairs, looking down uh, with them all interacting together. So I thought that that would make a great group photo. Let's go ahead and look at our first image here. And this is the ambient light. And I wanna tell you about my exposure. So I was shooting at 1 125th at F7.1 at ISO 1250. And I was using a 16 millimeter lens. The reason why I was shooting with such high ISO and also stopping down my lens to 7.1 is because I needed a lot of depth of field in the scene. In fact, when I shot it originally, I shot it at a lower f-stop number and I didn't have enough stuff in focus. Just the piano player was in focus, but not the people up on the stairs. And so I had to call everyone over again and have them do a quick do-over so that I could get it right. When you're doing a shot like this and you're thinking about depth of field, just know that wherever you focus, you're gonna have a certain distance in your shot that's going to be in focus from that point where you're focusing. And one little rule of thumb there is like, let's say the camera is over here and our focus point is here, that depth of field is actually going to be aligned more like this. So that less is going to be in focus towards the camera and more is gonna be in focus away from the camera. So when you're trying to figure out where to focus in a situation like this, just focus on that midway point or a little closer between your two subjects, if you will, your two planes that you're trying to focus. So for me, I was trying to focus on the piano player and I was trying to focus on the people on top of the stairs. So what I did was I focused on the front top edge of the piano, knowing that that would be about two feet from the piano player's face and maybe about four or five feet from the crowd. So that's a good way to use depth of field to sort of bend the reality to what you needed to do so that you can get a shot uh, that's in focus like this one. So in this next shot, we're gonna see just the key lights, if you will. So I was using a 70 centimeter deep octobox on camera right, boomed high and up there, if you will, lighting the people on the stairs. And then I lit the piano player with the 30 by 90 centimeter or 30 by 100 centimeter, I'm never really sure which one it is uh, with a grid. The reason I was doing that is because that's the only light that I had with me that had a grid and I wanted to control that light so that it wasn't going everywhere all over the set. And that's the reason why I chose those two fixtures.
The next thing I want to talk about is I planned on using a kicker over here on camera right, pointed back at the actors. And as you can see in this, not actors, but talent, as you can see in this frame, um, it is doing something and contributing to the shot. But I think in all the chaos of trying to balance all of these lights and all of these people and get the shot all here at the last second under a time crunch, I think I forgot to keep... Uh, working with it or making sure that it was there. So I think even though you see it firing by itself in this test frame, I don't see it doing much in the final image. And so I think you could just know that it's there, but don't really give it a whole lot of weight. The next thing I did was I added a yellow light over here on camera right, just uh, next to the piano player. This was a light with a pair of barn doors that I got on Amazon with a 30 degree grid inside and a yellow gel. And I put it over here thinking that it was going to sort of give me that nightclub kind of feel and edge out the piano player, but I also thought that it would cast light across the surface of the piano and sort of brighten that up, but it didn't really fulfill that purpose, but it did edge out the piano player pretty well. And this is another example of where I just had to keep it moving. And even though that was my original idea of what that light was for, I just had to sort of say, okay, well, it's doing something and I like what it's doing, you know, let's just move on. So the next thing I noticed is that the subject that I had on the far left at the top of the stairs, the one in the black shirt with the red tie, his hair was blending into the ceiling because the ceiling is pure black. So what I did is I added another small light and I, what I did is I put an Ellen Crumb one with a red gel pointed straight up on a table that's up there behind them pointed at the ceiling. And that's why you started to see these red highlights up here. And the reason I chose a red gel is because I knew that it would mimic sort of the red color of the paint that was already there in the room and it would sort of look more seamless and cohesive. And it's also around this time that I figured out that the shot would be better as a horizontal than a vertical. And maybe this would take up two pages in the magazine. And so I just went with that going forward. So as we look at the final select here, you'll see that I ended up with the strip softbox that I was using to light the piano player in, in the final shot. And so what I ended up doing was just sort of selecting it and using content aware fill and then making it look like a speaker. That way it it sort of just blended in. I wish that it wasn't there. I was using the RF 16 millimeter 2.8 uh, because it's the widest lens that I had in my bag. I didn't bring my 16 to 35 um, on the shoot because I ran out the door in a hurry. And this particular RF 16 2.8 has a lot of distortion. And so I'm not sure if the camera shows it with a correction profile attached. I think mine does. But of course, when I got into Capture One, there was all that distortion there and so maybe I didn't see it but maybe I just missed it because I was moving too quickly and we were doing about three looks or four looks in 90 minutes with all these lights and all these people so you know a lot was going on the other thing is there was a reflection of the piano there, um, reflection of the Octavox in the piano, and I couldn't really get it out, so I just had uh, the retoucher take it out uh, when he was doing his thing. And he also cleaned up the ceiling and removed these wires and you know, just sort of polished the image overall. So the next image that we're gonna talk about is this bar scene. And this was in fact the image that ended up on the cover. And so when I saw the images of the room in advance of doing the shoot, I knew that I wanted to create this photo here because it looked so cool having the chandeliers and I thought those and the sconces and the shot together at the top, as well as all the people at the bottom or in the middle of the frame would just make a really nice composition. So I knew I wanted to get this shoot done. And then immediately I started thinking about how I could accomplish that uh, with a number of lights. So we're gonna go over those here uh, one at a time. But first of all, we're gonna look at the ambient light only. So I was shooting at 1 50th of a second at 7.1 at ISO 640, and my lens was set to 40 millimeters. I was using the Canon RF 28 to 70 F2 for all of these shots. But of course, I wasn't shooting it at F2. I was shooting at 7.1 because I needed depth of field so that all of the talent would be in focus, including the bartenders. So they were a little further back there, so I needed a little bit more depth in my shot. So that's the reason why I was doing that. The next light we're gonna talk about here is I added in this kicker on camera right 
in the top corner of the room. And the reason why I have this light here is because I wanted to give a sense that the light from the chandelier was coming into our scene and lighting the talent. So that's what the motivation was for that light. The next two lights that I want to talk about are two lights that I put on bar stools behind the bar pointed at the wall. I put two lights there gelled red. And the reason why I gelled them red is because I wanted to light up that black uh, brick wall and I wanted to give it that red color so it would match the color scheme we have overall in the shoot and also so that it would match those red lights that were under the bar. I also had a fill light on during the course of the shoot. I just wanted to own the shadows a little bit by putting some of uh, my own light in there. Uh, uh, so that I could get the shadow detail that I wanted. So I had a 100 centimeter or 39 inch deep Octobox right next to me and it was turned up just enough so you would see its impact. The reason why I'm not giving you light meter readings or distance markings or anything like that during today's breakdown is because I'm, you know, knowing what the modifiers are and knowing what the light looks like in the final image, I think is all you'd sort of need to know in order to make this happen. But more so, you are not gonna walk in the same bar with the same people, with the same modifiers and the same exact lights. And so all of those things, it's more that I wanted to give you an idea of how I thought about lighting it and how I was thinking about using each light to perform a role so that you might take this as inspiration, let's hope, the next time you are in a situation like this and start to think, well, if I'm trying to recreate what real light looks like, what does that look like? And how do I add my lighting to the situation so that I'm getting a cool image, but I'm also not washing things out and making them look boring or making them look wholly artificial. And it's sort of like taking inspiration from the environment and then making decisions as a photographer about which notes or instruments you wanna play in order to get the picture that you would like to get. And so the brightness of each light is really gonna depend sort of on, you know, uh, you know, how you like it and how you like it to look. So it's sort of like adding salt and pepper to taste. You're just gonna do enough so that you get the flavor uh, that you're going for. And now looking at these two frames, you can see just what that kicker is doing in the back of the room by looking at his hair and seeing what it looks like without the, the yellow light firing and with that yellow light up there firing. In case I didn't say it earlier, there is a CTO or yellow gel on this light, giving it a little bit of color. And of course, I'm using that to mimic the light coming from the chandelier. I'm gonna guess that it's a CTO gel, um, but you know, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it was yellow, both would be fine in this kind of situation. And now in our next frame, you can see what the main light looks like firing here on camera left. That would be our main light on camera left. And it is that one uh, by three or 30 by 90 centimeter strip softbox with the grid on it. And I put it over here so that it would light uh, this guy right here that's facing here on camera left. And I wanted to edge him out really nicely. And then also as sort of a good side effect is that it would, it would light that guy's face, but it would also edge out the guy's uh, neck that he was talking to and get some nice separation of him from the background and also light the bartender as well. Then for the final light for this scene, I added that 70 centimeter strip softbox again over here on camera right, boomed out over the set, pointed down towards the talent at just a slight angle. And that light uh, lit everybody on the right and probably the bartender that's here in the back, the in the middle of the frame. I had to dodge him out quite a bit because he was a little dim, but again, maybe if I were doing this as an ad shoot, I would have added more key lights, if you will, in order to get everybody lit properly. I'm sure I probably would have done that because it's hard on a commercial set to sort of say like, oh, just imagine I'm gonna dodge him a stop and it'll be fine. You kind of want to do things for real on the commercial set, but you know, and this kind of quick pace thing, like, yeah, you're just going to be like, we'll fix it later and don't worry about it. Even though that's really different from what you hear me say, when you're crunched for time, sometimes you just got to deal with it and know that confidently that you can pull the image out if you need to. 
and fix it. Now, I wouldn't go out there trying to underexpose something by five stops and dodge it. Don't think that. I'm just saying like, it's perfect enough. Let's move on because we got a lot of stuff to do and we got to keep it moving. Now you can see here in the final image that I had the retoucher remove a lot of the wires that were on the wall and that sort of thing because I found them to be distracting. The conduit also removed the light stand uh, for uh, the kicker that's back there and just sort of polish the image overall. But before we move on, I just wanted to say that if you enjoy learning from me in these videos, you probably would also love learning from me in person. And soon I'll be teaching one day lighting workshops at my studio in Chicago and in Houston. And I'll be teaching a two day advanced lighting workshop at my studio in Chicago as well that's limited to only five people. So if you wanna find out more information about the workshops, just go to johngress.com slash workshops. And now for our fourth and final image, I planned on shooting all of the talent on the stage with my optical snoot, but I ran into a problem. The stage lights were on, and if you know anything about optical snoots, they eat light for breakfast. And so the idea that I was gonna project a perfect circle onto them was completely impossible because the distance I needed to move the light back from the stage in order to project a large circle, in order to photograph eight people, it was just not going to happen in any sort of way where I would get enough brightness to overcome the brightness of those stage lights by let's say two stops in order to make my circle show up. So I just had to scrap it and I looked for the next best alternative. And so since I had shot the other three, or at least the stage was the third wall in the space, I looked to see what I could do on the fourth wall in the space. And so I turned to my left and I looked at that wall and I saw another table scene there with a picture frame and two sconces. And so I decided that what I was gonna do was line the actors up there along the talent, they're not actors, line them up there along the wall and that I would then add in my optical snoot and uh, make this final image that you see here. But first, let's talk about what the ambient light looks like by itself. So I was shooting at 1 1 25th of a second at f3.5 at ISO 1600, and my lens was at 31 millimeters. I figured 3.5 was enough depth of field even though I probably would have liked more depth of field, but thinking about what would happen if I stopped down to, let's say 5.0 and 3200 ISO, I thought that might be a little too dodgy. So I just went with it at 3.5 and did a Hail Mary. I shot this picture in maybe about two seconds, not two seconds, two minutes. I turned the optical snoot over there, got my circle in the place that I wanted it with the talent where I, I wanted them, and I took this frame and we retouched it. So we got rid of the conduit again and this annoying thermostat and things looked uh, really well. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed that breakdown. If you wanna check out the magazine, click on the link in the description. You can see it all in print or at least a PDF of it if you'd like. If you have any questions or comments, just leave those below. And as always, stay safe, have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon.